Okay, let's get started. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, How to Run Kubernetes Securely and Efficiently. I'm Jerry Fallon, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters today, Joe Pelletier, VP of Products at Fairwinds, and Robert Brennan, Director of Open Source at Fairwinds. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions in there, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that this a recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at CNCF dot io slash webinars and with that i'll hand it off to our presenters for today's webinar take it away thanks a lot um, hello everyone thanks for joining today's webinar my name is joe pelletier i'm uh heads up i head up the product side of things at, at fairwinds uh, and we're really excited today to uh, give you an overview of how to run kubernetes securely and efficiently <clears throat> um, we will spend a little bit of time today to talk about some of the uh, uh, reasons why organizations choose Kubernetes, as well as some of the challenges they experience and uh, some of the technical implications for the security and efficiency angle here. We'll also share a little bit more about uh, configuration validation solutions and, and how they can help you uh, with this challenge. So let's take a, a, a quick step back and just look at containers. And uh, we all know that containers have really changed how software is developed. And at its core, you know, container technology uh, allows applications to be packaged and distributed across a number of different platforms. And a lot of this software packaging is shifting left into the development process. Uh, developers are taking a lot more responsibility for containerizing their applications. And as they embrace container orchestration platforms like Kubernetes, they may also be exposed to the configuration of how those containers run in production. Uh, the second major uh, you know, trend that we're seeing is that container adoption is growing quickly. And according to Gartner, uh, by 2023, 70% of enterprises will be running at least two or more containerized applications. Finally, um, Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for container orchestration, and it's entering the mainstream. And in many cases, uh, new projects or new development teams might be embracing Kubernetes as their platform of choice for running containers in production. And you know, some of the reasons why organizations choose containers and Kubernetes is really at its core to enable teams to ship faster. At the end of the day, the, there has to be a business ROI and uh, that ROI is often measured in terms of code deployment frequency, the mean time to repair for applying security uh, patches or updating um, a bad image, as well as um, the, the ability to provision and create new resources. And so when you combine containers and Kubernetes technology with cloud and infrastructure as a service, you can find that teams are able to get to production with their application a lot quicker, giving these businesses an order of magnitude and improvement in terms of their development process. But despite a lot of these uh, innovations with containers and kube and a lot of the great business benefits that can come with it, uh, there are still challenges. And there was actually a CNCF survey uh, from 2019 that um, really helped under, uh, you know, unpack what some of those key challenges might be in using and deploying containers. And uh, what they discovered was there's actually, you know, the, the first challenge is around that cultural shift. Um, moving from containers and to Kubernetes uh, is really a change for a lot of development teams. And with that change comes uh, new best practices, new concepts to learn, um, and really new tooling. And so we'll, we'll talk about that today at, at, at a core. Uh, the second is really the security angle. Uh, with all that change, there's new security uh, paradigms that need to be considered. Um, and, you know, that also leads into the third challenge, which is complexity. And complexity uh, from our experience at Fairwinds goes beyond just the technical complexity of containers and kube, but it's also the organizational complexity. And we'll speak to that in just a bit. So let's kind of 
uh, poke at first the cultural shift and, and what's changing as part of the development process as development um, DevOps teams and security teams come together uh, to embrace container and Kubernetes technologies. And, uh, you know, depending on, on, on the organization, the development team might actually be in the, the team responsible for uh, building those container images. Um, but we're also noticing that uh, the responsibility around configuration, so the configuration for how those uh, containers run into Kubernetes infrastructure, that is sometimes shared between development and DevOps. And finally, uh, the DevOps teams and the SRE teams, they're responsible for maintaining the base core platform of Kube. And that might mean selecting the right add-ons, configuring those add-ons, and keeping all those configurations and software up to date. And finally, you know, security. The security team definitely has a, a view and a set of requirements that, uh, across the whole SDLC. Um, and you know, as it applies to containers and Kubernetes, uh, there's, you know, new ramifications there as well. So here are some specific examples, though, of, you know, what needs to be considered from a technical perspective uh, as organizations, you know, leverage containers and Kube. You know, at the container level, really understanding, you know, what your known vulnerability exposure might be um, and whether or not you're using trusted images uh, becomes, a you know, a key part of the, the changes that uh, a, take place as you as you leverage container technology and you know similarly on the configuration side uh, there's a number of different uh, configurations that either can uh, create security challenges or uh, introduce reliability or efficiency challenges um, on a security perspective it, you might you know over permission a container um, you might accidentally uh, introduce privilege escalation um, or you might be missing um, readiness probes, liveness probes, or uh, uh, the re resource requests and limits that specify to Kubernetes how to scale up and down your app. And we're going to cover some of these very specific examples later in the presentation uh, to give you a sense of um, how these changes to the development process, uh, you know, introduce new requirements that you know, need to be considered. That other area that we talked about was really the complexity. And um, as uh, organizations leverage containers and Kubernetes, different teams need to uh, come up to speed on what this means for them. So with the developer, a lot of times the developer is just really trying to focus on writing their application code and getting their applications shipped to production as quickly as possible. You know, they're paid to execute on roadmap and develop new features. And sometimes, you know, for the developer, the fastest way to get something shipped might be um, over provision, provisioning resources. So saying, you know, I just need to get this to run. So I'm going to allocate a lot of CPU and memory, um, or it might be, um, you know, uh, creating permissions that um, allow the application to run potentially insecurely. And it's just because they want to get to production as quickly as possible. And uh, a lot of that has to do with, you know, these new technical complexities that come into place with, with containers and Kube. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you might have the SRE or the operations team, and they're in trying to ensure availability and reliability of the apps. And so as these teams receive applications and configuration from development, they're going to be looking for a specific set of best practices being followed. Like they want to, for example, make sure that the health checks are implemented uh, so Kubernetes knows how to uh, restart that application and scale that application accordingly. And finally, the, uh, the security team and the leadership team, they want to make sure everything that is running in production is secure. And that's where uh, ensuring that you have your security uh, requirements set, as well as um, your checking for those uh, things like known vulnerabilities and containers become really important for uh, securing the infrastructure. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to actually ask my colleague, uh, Robert, who heads up our open source here at Fairwinds to share a little bit more around the technical aspects of where security and efficiency challenges may emerge in uh, cloud-based infrastructure. Thanks, Joe. So there's really three layers of the stack you want to be thinking about as you develop a strategy around Kubernetes. At the lowest layer, you have the container level. 
Uh, this is where you want to be thinking about the operating system you're running on top of and thinking about any any CVEs that might exist inside of those container images, uh, either at the operating system level or in the libraries that are being installed on top of that operating system. And you also want to think about how those containers are being pulled as they get deployed into your cluster. One layer up from that, we have the deployment configuration. Uh, so this is basically how Kubernetes uh, is running your container uh, inside, of, inside of the cluster. Uh, and here you want to be thinking about uh, how this configuration is set up. Are the containers being uh, given excessive permissions uh, to have too much access to the host? Uh, are they uh, being configured in an efficient way? Do they have health checks set? Uh, are the memory and CPU limits and requests being set appropriately? Uh, all that kind of configuration. And then finally, at the highest level, you want to think about the Kubernetes cluster itself. Uh, so here you're thinking about you know, what add-ons are installed. Are those add-ons up to date? Uh, is role-based access control in place? Uh, and is the principle of least privilege being applied? Uh, how are the kubelets being configured? Uh, are my node uh, sizes being chosen appropriately? Those sorts of things. So today we're really going to focus on those first two layers. Uh, so namely the, the container layer and the Kubernetes configuration layer. Uh, and the, the difference here is that at the container layer, we're really thinking about the underlying operating system uh, the, and the libraries that are being installed on top of it. Whereas at the Kubernetes configuration layer, we're thinking about how that, that container runs on side of a host node, or uh, on a host node. Um, and what permissions does it have? So at the container level, uh, really what we want to be focused on are known vulnerabilities. Um, so these, these might be vulnerabilities that affect the base operating system or might affect uh, libraries that you've installed on top of that operating system. Uh, and these vulnerabilities could be exploited in really any number of different ways. Uh, they could allow the user to gain root access to the, to the container itself, uh, to the host that's running the container. Uh, they could allow the user to, uh, the attacker to exfiltrate data, uh, to trigger a denial of service. Um, really any kind of vulnerability could crop up in these, in these libraries. Uh, one big issue that we see frequently is, is teams will scan their containers once, say at build time or at deploy time, and think that they're safe as long as those scans passed. But as new CVEs get announced, your, your images that pass the first time could become vulnerable. So it's important to be continuously scanning these images over time. Another issue we see uh, moves up to the, the Kubernetes configuration level, uh, which is where you specify how those containers are going to be running inside your cluster. Uh, Kubernetes provides a lot of configuration uh, that allows you to say, give your containers a little bit more access to the host nodes. Uh, typically your applications don't need this access, but if an application isn't running, often the easiest way to get it working is to uh, just start adding, adding new permissions here. Uh, developers are often not certain exactly which permissions their, their application should need in order to run. Uh, if you have these, uh, these permissions set uh, you know, overly permissively, uh, it could allow an attacker to uh, gain access to, you know, basically spread their access if they attack this one application, spread that access throughout the cluster. Uh, so say if, you're, if your container is running as root, that could allow the attacker to gain access to the host node. Another common misconfiguration issue is not setting health probes on your workloads. Um, this is technically an optional part of the workload configuration. Uh, but it's highly recommended for, for all production deployments. Um, this is really how Kubernetes can tell if your our workload is healthy or not. Uh, it will repeatedly call the liveness and readiness probes to see whether your workload is responding appropriately. Um, this is really important uh, just to make sure that it, you know, if your application does crash or become unresponsive, Kubernetes can tell that, kill it, and start a new, uh, a new pod. Um, and to make sure that as you release new deployments, Kubernetes can scale the old deployment down and scale the new one up uh, appropriately so you don't experience any downtime during that process. Finally, another, another issue we frequently see is inappropriately set resource requests and limits. And the big issue here is that it's hard to know ahead of time exactly how much CPU and memory your application needs uh, in production in order to run uh, appropriately. Um, so often developers will, you know, either completely neglect to set these settings uh, or they'll over provision, you know, they'll, they'll ask for an excessive amount of CPU and memory, you know, far more than they actually need. 
just to know that their application isn't going to crash in production. Um, and this can lead to huge cost overruns. You may be spending a lot more money than you actually need because developers have requested, you know, twice as much memory than they actually need. Um, it, can, it can also lead to uh, Kubernetes not being able to detect uh, legitimate problems with your application. Say if there's a memory leak inside your application and you've got 10 times the memory you actually need requested, uh, that memory leak is going to continue on for a lot longer uh, without Kubernetes detecting it. So to recap, uh, you can see security issues uh, from both the uh, at the container level where known CVEs are running inside your containers uh, or at the, the deployment configuration level where a container has uh, permissions to say run as root on the host. Uh, you can also see uh, efficiency issues with missing health probes and with resource requests and limits not being set appropriately. That's great. Thanks, Robert, for sharing some of those technical details. Um, it sounds like a lot of these issues, you know, come into play once organizations leverage uh, Kubernetes and containers at scale and, you know, then need to have a way to, you know, monitor these configurations and stay in, uh, ahead of these problems before they occur. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's actually kind of gives way into um, a new category of, of open source and uh, software tooling that we're seeing in the Kubernetes space. Um, called configuration validation. Um, so a lot of times, you know, uh, when it comes to ensuring that the containers are being uh, tested for known vulnerabilities and that the configuration is also being inspected for the things that Robert went through, um, you need to leverage these configuration validation solutions so that uh, DevOps teams can maintain those consistent configurations for the containers, the deployments, and the overall cluster infrastructure uh, as more and more teams end up leveraging and deploying into Kube. Um, a lot of these configuration validation solutions are providing organizations um, with the, the findings as well as the fix recommendations, usually in the um, context of a YAML snippet or YAML code, as well as uh, controls for policy-driven enforcement that allow you to uh, prevent these problems from in being introduced into, into the cluster. And so ultimately the business value of these configuration validation solutions uh, is a way to reduce risk, save money, uh, and just avoid um, wasting a lot of manual effort that the ops team would ultimately have to take on. Um, so we wanted to kind of give um, some recommendations for any organization that's looking to uh, implement configuration validation solution, sort of what, what are the key steps that um, you'll need to take in order to you know, move in this direction? And really the, the first step um, uh, is sort of the discovery step where you need to get the data around where you have potential misconfigurations around security or efficiency or even reliability challenges. Uh, fortunately, with the Kubernetes ecosystem, there's uh, a prolific number of uh, open source tools and options out there, and a lot of them are really great for getting a grip on specific challenges or specific issues. Um, you know, the best, pl best place to start is going out and researching to find the right tools for the right uh, specific area, whether it's, you know, scanning your containers for known bones or uh, checking your deployment configurations or inspecting your cluster. Um, you know, once you find those tools, you, you have to script, script them so that they can run on a regular basis. Uh, and then you'll have to do some work around um, analyzing the data. So that might mean uh, deduplicating findings, um, ensuring that they have the right severity on them so that you can prioritize which of the issues that you want to fix first. Um, and then make sure you have the reporting and the, the integrations into dashboards and into downstream systems like Slack um, uh, that may you know, allow you to notify the end users at the right time of when they might, there might be a configuration challenge. Um, once you get the data though, the, uh, the next step is really to assign ownership, right? You wanna make sure that uh, there are owners to these things and that you're getting the information to the right end user. Um, for example, like a, a CVE might be something that a development team has to take on, whereas um, an out of date, um, add-on in the Kubernetes infrastructure or a misconfigured deployment might be something that a DevOps team or an SRE team may have to take on. And so depending on what you're uh, finding as, as issues, it's, you're going to have to assign it to the right owners. And ultimately, um, 
we, we talked about how containers and Kube are new. They're changing the development process. Um, the best solutions will provide you with some uh, amount of remediation guidance so that you know how to fix these issues um, as you go along. Now, um, what we just described was a sort of a multi-step journey so uh, around how to configure, uh, validate your Kubernetes configurations. And uh, fortunately, there's, there's three different ways or three different paths you can choose. Um, we do see some organizations building their own tooling so that they're taking their best practices and, and enforcing that as their own auditing standards. Um, and that's definitely one path. Um, the second one is leveraging some open source and we'll share with you today some recommended open source solutions. Uh, and the third is leveraging a purpose built platform uh, that focuses on uh, configuration validation as its core feature set. Uh, so the first one is around building your own tools. Obviously the advantages of this approach is that it's going to be fully customized to your needs. Um, and it, you know, it might give your team some room to even learn about Kubernetes um, in the process of building these tools so that you're defining the best practices that meet your organization um, specifically. Um, you know, but as with any effort like this, it's going to require some amount of uh, time outside of normal business as usual activities. You're going to have to plan for this. You're going to have to allocate some engineering resource, and then you're going to have to maintain the tools that you do build. Um, some organizations go down this path and it, it works really well for them. Um, but there is an overhead associated with that, uh, mostly around the long tail of, of maintaining these tools as uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem evolves. Uh, the next one is really focused on leveraging open source tools. And um, as we mentioned earlier, the Kubernetes ecosystem is, uh, has many, many different open source options. Uh, we have a link here to a great GitHub page that uh, provides a list of awesome open source tools. And you know, because it's open source, they're free. You can download and start using them right away. Um, and, and many of the solutions too are, um, you know, very powerful. They're, they're more than just small little tools. Um, they are, you know, powerful solutions that enable you to uh, inspect and audit your Kubernetes environment. Um, the challenge though with some of these tools is that they are usually focused on just one, doing one thing really well, which means that you might need to use multiple tools in order to get a well-rounded view um, at your security challenges or your efficiency challenges. Um, there's definitely um, different, each tool comes with its own way of running it and using the data. Uh, so it can be hard to operationalize them when you have to consume the data in multiple formats, uh, which means that you might also have some challenges getting support if it's, if it's just an open source project and there's no uh, vendor uh, that offers support, it might be a challenge to uh, get the help you need to interpret the data and, and use these tools at scale. Uh, which really leads it's, you know, those, you know, two different options really lead uh, into a third option, which is, you know, leveraging a purpose built platform. And um, Fairwinds does have software in this space called Fairwinds Insights. And it, um, there is uh, a use case around being able to aggregate the findings and leverage the tools um, that are best of breed in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So you have one platform that can audit your Kubernetes infrastructure for security as well as efficient, efficiency and reliability challenges. Uh, the great thing about this is that it is you know, ongoing um, support. It integrates the best of breed open source so that you still get to leverage those same great tools. Um, but the value is really on adding, organizing the data, helping you prioritize it, and ultimately implement policies so that you can enforce uh, the rules specific to your organization around what's uh, allowed and what may not be allowed. Obviously, the downside of, of solutions like this is it generally requires some amount of budget in order to pay for these tools. Um, and there, um, some of the, uh, the, sol the solutions uh, may not be fully open source. They might contain some open source components and then um, have a certain amount of commercial components to it as well. Uh, so if you're interested in purpose-built platforms, uh, the best ones um, that we've seen have the opportunity to prioritize findings uh, from multiple open source tools. So having that framework where the vendor is adding more and more tools over time um, and making it easy for you to integrate data from third parties into a single pane of glass, um, that is one of the key you know, uh, components of a configuration validation solution. 
Um, you'll also want to be able to integrate the data into downstream systems that you use. So that might mean CI, CD systems, uh, Slack or chat op systems, as well as um, monitoring tools like Datadog or Grafana. Um, the other um, uh, key consideration here is run these configuration validation platforms they really need to run in multiple locations. You wanna think about it as a way to check these configurations in the CID process, as well as um, right before deployment so that you can have a, a validating webhook that allows you to validate whether or not the deployment's meeting your best practices, um, as well as in production. So you can understand what's already gotten into production that may or may not be uh, in compliance with your standards. Um, finally, um, any of these solutions should also be able to address uh, containers, configuration, and cluster level type of risks. So here's a, a brief kind of illustration that shows the ideal integration points. Um, being able to integrate into a CI CD context, um, some of these tools are great for running earlier in the process, like uh, scanning your containers uh, for known vulnerabilities. That's something that can happen at the time of uh, the build phase. Um, as well as scanning your Kubernetes manifests or your YAML files, your Helm charts. Uh, that's also something that can operate on the file that comes from your Git repo. Um, at the pre-deployment stages, as well as in the cluster, um, you might have an opportunity to do a lot more um, security scanning, as well as um, resource efficiency and optimizations. Uh, so one example is uh, Fairwinds has an open source tool that is called Goldilocks which helps you with um, optimizing your workloads uh, to be resource efficient. So that means we're going to give you recommendations for setting your CPU and memory requests and limits so that you can keep your workloads um, right size and avoid them from being starved in production in the sense of some workloads not receiving enough compute or resources, um, as well as not spending too much money in over allocating those, that compute. Um, so finally, you know, let's recap on what the business benefits might be. Um, you know, when you can configure, when you can validate your Kubernetes configurations, you're putting your business in a position where you can improve the overall security posture of your containers that are running, as well as the configuration that describes how those containers should run in Kubernetes. Um, the, with configuration validation, you do have the opportunity to prioritize so that you're not just addressing all the problems. It will help you understand which are the most important. The second business benefit is going to be really focused on cost and efficiency. Um, just, you know, security is, is, is very important, but so is also making sure that your workloads are running efficiently and reliably so that you're not overspending and you're not also starving some of your most important applications. And finally, any of these platforms really need to demonstrate not only a financial ROI from a cost and sec or security perspective, but also a time savings perspective. How can you ensure that your ops team is not manually inspecting these configurations on a, cons on a you know, ongoing basis? And how can you provide a platform that allows you to bridge that gap between developers, SRE teams, and security teams so that they all have a single pane of glass to collaborate from? So with that, um, we wanted to make sure that you were all aware of a uh, great open source guide or a great guide that we have on fairwinds.com around helping you understand the best ways to manage Kubernetes configuration for security, efficiency, and reliability. Um, or if you're interested in trying out some of the tools that we had discussed today, um, feel free to check out fairwinds.com for a free trial of our insights offering. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Jerry for opening up any sort of Q&A that we may have uh, at this stage. Okay, well, thank you both for a wonderful presentation. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. There's a question we have here. What is the best way to get started? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll go and take that first. So um, we talked about how configuration validation platforms are, are especially purpose-built ones like, like Fairwinds Insights provide a bunch of tools out of the gate. Um, but another great way to get started is just by going back to the open source community, um, the Kubernetes open source community and looking at the individual tools that may exist. Um, give you an example, we um, at, at Fairwinds uh, have developed a open source solution called uh, Fairwinds Polaris, which uh, you can run uh, very quickly to understand where you might have certain configuration issues with the workloads running in your, your cluster. Um, that's a solution that we see a lot of folks uh, gravitating towards in order to get a quick view in terms of where their risks might be today. Um, similarly, there's al also a variety of um, great container scanning open source out there. Uh, Trivi, uh, which is maintained by Aqua Security, is a, is a fantastic uh, container scanning uh, open source tool that um, many organizations use to understand the risk of their containers. Um, and you know, finally, uh, we mentioned about Fairwinds Goldilocks, another open source offering that focuses on resource optimization. So um, there are great open source starting points. I think that is a way to get started if you're focused on a very particular problem. Um, if you realize that you find value in all these tools and you wanna run them on a consistent basis, that's a great point to then graduate to a configuration validation platform like, like Fairwinds Insights. Um, Robert, I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to suggest though as well. No, I totally agree. I think in terms of getting started, the open source community is, you know, that's where you're going to get the quickest bang for your buck in terms of, uh, um, you know, just being able to get a quick overview of, you know, what's going on inside your cluster, maybe where the biggest issues lie. Um, and then as you mature along your journey, I think a, a larger platform uh, like Fairwinds Insight is, is very helpful. Do any of these open source tools confirm to security benchmark standards? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question. So there are um, some standards out there, like um, a popular one is the CIS uh, Kubernetes benchmark. Um, that is a, uh, a Kubernetes security benchmark that's published by the Computer Information Systems uh, Consortium. I may have gotten that wrong, but um, it's a very common one for understanding at a, from an automated perspective and a baseline perspective, is my cluster aligned with security best practices? Um, there are some great open source implementations of that benchmark. Um, I believe we uh, leverage one called KubeBench, which is also, uh, uh, I think, managed by Aqua Security. It's an open source uh, tool, so anyone can use it. Um, and it gives you a quick view in terms of where are my, uh, what you know, where do I line up right now in terms of my cluster as it's designed and running? Am I, um, am I violating any sort of obvious compliance uh, and security issues? And so that's a great one to start with. Um, we do hear about uh, you know, standards like PCI and HIPAA and SOC 2. And uh, depending on um, the specific requirement there, there are some Kubernetes uh, aspects to that, but that's where you probably need to look at more commercial type off offerings. Does Fairwinds Insight also take care of application level misconfigurations or vulnerabilities that could be present due to bad programming? Uh, good question. So it's, um, I think that's, um, I see they're referring to injection as an example. So uh, Fairwinds Insights uh, does not focus on the actual application code. Um, there are um, a variety of uh, application security type solutions out in the market that are open source and some commercial, um, but we focus more at the container, uh, the Kubernetes configuration la layer, um, and, the, and what's running in the cluster. So we're um, focusing kind of on the layer just below that. Um, you know, if you are interested in application security solutions, there are definitely a, some open source ones out there. Um, and you know, in general, those are great complementary solutions to what we're doing here as well. Um, when you think about the need to validate your kube configurations and test your containers, um, that is is uh, something that you should do in conjunction with testing your application code as well. Any more questions at all?
Are there other pen test tools for Kubernetes besides Aqua Security? Yeah, that's a, another great question. I think there's uh, there's if there's probably uh, several dozen different uh, auditing tools. I would say in general for Kubernetes, um, we we actually shared a link earlier in the presentation to uh, a number of those tools. I'll actually just uh, put it here on the screen for a second. Um, there's you know great lists on on GitHub that share lists of auditing tools. Some of them might be penetration testing specific as well. Um, the uh, what Fairwinds has found is that it actually you actually want to take kind of a, a comprehensive perspective. So while you do want to uh, do uh, pen testing tools, you also want to make sure you're implementing uh, checks on your containers, on your configuration, as well as what's running in uh, the cluster itself. And so that will give you more of a, a you know comprehensive view at the configuration and security posture of your uh, in infrastructure, but. A great starting point might be going to this GitHub page and looking at some of the auditing tools that they have available. Okay, anyone else? If anyone does have questions, please leave them into the Q&A box. It'll be easier for us to spot if you can. Thank you. Anyone at all? All right, well, no one else has any other questions and that we'll wrap this up a little early today. I wanted to thank both Robert and Joe for their presentation today. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, folks. Thank you.